So uh, while Joe is getting set up for the last hour, um, we're going to talk a bit about Jupyter Notebooks um, and how we're using them um, at Argon uh, to help with analysis. So you guys use Jupyter Notebooks for the, only the quantum session? All right. Um, how many people had used, knew about Jupyter Notebooks before they got here? So this is pretty exciting. So I kind of ask this question every year. And we've been doing it for the last couple years. And it seems each year more and, people, more and more people are becoming familiar with them. So that's great. So from, um, so you guys have access to the, to the slides here, right? You guys can get to this. Right, so if you go to the, the slide presentation, um, there's a, a path here for um, uh, repository. And so if you, from a, a shell on Cooley, so if you log into Cooley and, and clone this repository, um, put it in your home directory. So from your home directory, if you run this, you, can, you should be able to copy and paste that from the slides. Um, you'll get that at repository and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how we're gonna access that through Jupyter. And for at least, I mean, you can follow along and not do um, uh, the stuff with us. Um, but for the first one, the, the one that I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna ask you guys to help us out in an experiment. Um, We've stood up a service called uh, jupyter.alcf.anl.gov uh, that is running a, a Jupyter hub um, within the Argon infrastructure. And we started this last year, just, just prior to the summer school. Um, we had all the students use it last year and they broke it, which is why we do experiments. Um, so we went back and did some re-engineering and bought a beefier machine and um, the guys at, back at Argon really want to see if you guys can break it again this year. Um, so if, if nothing else, for the first set of things that we walk through, try them along with me and see if we can grind this machine to a halt. All right? You still have to log in, right? Yeah, no, so I have. So, um, all right, let's go there. All right, so this is in, um, right, so if, So, so once you've done a, a git clone of that um, repository in your home directory, then from a browser, if you go to jupyter.alcf.gov, alcf.anl.gov, right, then you log in with your crypto card. All right, so how many people are in and on Jupyter at ALCF? We get, we get about halfway there. We'll start up. All right, give it another minute or so. All right, so that should put you in your home directory. And so if you navigate into that, this Jupyter at PESC 2018 directory that you just um, cloned, that'll get you to where Mike is currently. All right, so we'll take a. Uh, Anyone having trouble or needing help? So how many people are at this point right now? I can see this, a screen that looks just like that. So we got, all right, this is pretty good. All right, so we're gonna work out of this, um, this re repository uh, for the rest of the time today. Um, the other thing I'll say is, we're gonna show you a bunch of different ways of approaching uh, the use of Jupiter. One is the first one that I'm gonna run through and then Joe will run through a couple and Sylvia will run through a couple. Each of those are using Jupiter in a slightly different way, but all kind of capturing what we think is important about Jupiter in that it gives you this kind of infrastructure to record your work. All right, did I see somebody had a question? Did you, somebody else have a problem up front here? So is anybody else having, a, having problems getting in? So when he does start server, it's giving some error. Says, talk to the admin. <laughs> um, one one thing that may help is if you remove your cookies related to Jupyter on your browser, or you try a different browser if you have another. Mm -hmm. 
Do you use Jupiter on a regular basis? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think I saw enough hands that we kind of got to this. So the first one we're going to go through is this uh, simple fluid example. And for me, um, we're not going to spend a lot of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to teach you how to do visualizations with Python. Um, that's a, a semester long course in itself. Um, but I want to be able to kind of highlight uh, the power of the notebook. And so this is, this is running off of the Jupyter resource at Argonne. And what's interesting about this or why I think having this resource is available, you're not sitting in a queue. You've calculated your data on the supercomputer. It's stored in your project directory. But from this machine, because of the way we engineered it within the ALCF, you can see your file system. And so as long as you don't need a whole supercomputer to do your analysis, you can actually work from this at any time from your desktop um, and do pretty powerful things uh, without sitting in a queue or even um, um, launching jobs. So this is a, a, a fluid visualization example, just a 2D fluid simulation. Um, this Dan Schroeder, I think, wrote it for a, a fluid dynamic class. And then uh, one of my postdoc, Tommy Marin, who's now a assistant professor at St. Thomas, um, paralyzed it. And we use it as kind of a, a training example of parallel computing. So what we're going to do first is, and this data um, is in the data directory. It's just a bunch of text files. Um, they're all zipped up. It's about 50 megs zipped up. Uh, once you uncompress the file, which I just did, so this is a bunch of Python stuff here to uh, import needed modules. But the key thing that's happening here is it's unzipping that data. It's going to fill about two gigs of uh, space on your uh, f local file system at Argon. Um, and then we're just going to pull out one of the files. Yes, I know text is not the efficient way to store data, but it's kind of, again, just for demonstration purposes. So this notebook's there. It's, it's a great example for you um, to go back and look and see how to do things and then use it to modify, um, uh, modify it for your, your own cases. So uh, I open and load this data file up. And then basically what I'm trying to do is go through a, a bunch of different steps along the way to turn this data into a 2D array. So it reads it all into this one, a 1D array. I, it's got about 300,000 data points. I convert it to a 2D array that represents some molasses flowing in a, in a cylinder. And you know, fairly short one lines of code here, I can make that transition. But what's key here is as you kind of get down to this, what you're calling this figure here, I'm able to specify a figure that's two units by five units with a specified grid size, and then ask for a contour plot of it. And that's three lines of code that has taken about 300,000 data points and turned it to an image. The nice thing is you can kind of go through this and you've captured your, uh, your workflow along the way. And you know there's things within, I can make this a little bit bigger, so you can see the data here. This is not necessarily oriented the right way, so I can do some things where I, oh, here I guess I changed the, the color map so I can see things a little bit better. I don't like that orientation, so I turn it on its side. And you can see each step along the way here, I'm just kind of building on what I did before. Um, again, this is not as much about uh, teaching you Python visualization as trying to demonstrate what you can capture here within the, the Jupyter Notebook. I tried to go along the way here and document both within the code and prior to each of these cells um, what's going on so that you have a good working example. Um, I think it's our intention this year, we didn't do this last year, is our intention to leave this repository up post um, the summer school so you'll have working examples of these different scenarios. 
So I've, I've taken the data here, I've turned it on its side, I'm, I started plotting the, the units, um, things that you want to do. I can go through here, add a title and labels on my, on my um, visualization. I can make those a little bit larger. So this is nice is, you can find all this stuff by Googling around, but this will give you kind of a great example to go through and, and build off of. And, you know, as I teach in the visualization classes, you, you, you want your units, you want some representation of um, the scale here. And, change and I again keep putting out the, the descriptions here um, you can see us evolving it I can lay, l overlay some contours on, <coughs> on the visualization here and as you can see even as we're getting to a pretty pretty complete visualization of this corn syrup experiment in a two meter pipe. Um, we're still really at uh, only a dozen lines of code. Um, I can add more contours, which may or may not be. And then, you know, down here, maybe 20 lines of code. I've actually started to render a movie. Um, movie to finish this is, and this is this is now we're into experiment mode right so now before we were taking a single slice of maybe a thousand frames now we're taking those thousand frames and creating a movie out of this hopefully you guys were all kind of following along and now there's um, 60 movies being created so we'll see how how the machine does um, John made a great point and I think you know if there's anything that you walk away from the visualization section, other than being exposed to the tools from Paraview and, and Visit um, and, and VMD, uh, is that at the end of the day, when it comes to visualization and, and kind of the visual presentation of your data, you'll spend most of your time manipulating the data. The actual generation of the images is really kind of getting to be a lot easier. So uh, a lot of this stuff here is just really kind of setting it up. Let's see how we're doing on our, so it will eventually show up. It knows that a fairly large movie is coming, um, even though, up oh, there it is. So is everybody getting a movie? All right, so the, the machine worked. So Tommy's gonna be very happy. And we should give a shout out to all the guys at Argon that are making sure that the machines are running in that. So um, in fairly short order, we went through, we loaded a thousand data sets um, up and we produced a movie here that can be embedded in our browser and we know exactly how we, how we got to this. I, you know, I've been doing visualization for, I'll just say a long time. Um, <laughs> a lot of times I'll get done and I'll uh, have produced a, a, a movie or an image. A couple years will go by and people will ask me how I got there. I don't remember how I got there. So I think one of the things that's powerful about the use of, um, of Jupyter Notebooks is you get this, this log, this ability to capture kind of how you get to a point. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe and Silvio to show you a couple more uses of Jupyter in a little more advanced uh, setting. Um, again, but again, kind of capturing how you get to the point of, of visualization. OK, questions? Did anybody get any error messages or anything fail in the, you, same, your same problems or, or new problem? You're still rendering? How okay. many people got it to render? All right, so well, Tommy's, awesome. Tommy's gonna be very happy. So very good. All right. Okay, give it some time. It, it takes some time. All right, so um, I'm actually gonna stop this. And then um, maybe I'll actually go to uh, my here, my home and running. I'm going to go ahead and shut down that notebook so that we don't have a million notebooks running. Well, we'll know it's running 
ask a question? Did those, did the quantum guys give you an introduction to Jupyter Notebooks? No. Uh, I don't know. Joe, maybe you t just kind of take them across that yeah, yeah, yeah. top so, screen. <laughs> um, right, so from the where you launched the that notebook, um, you have a couple of tabs that are you know, files running and clusters. So if you look under running, um, it shows you the list of notebooks that you currently have running. Um, and I just, there was a little button there that said stop or kill or whatever. Shut down. Shut down. Yeah. Um, so I shut down that notebook. So now that, that notebook's no longer running in the background. Um, so if we go back to, uh, to files and go back up to the main Jupyter at Pesk um, directory, the next one we're going to take a look at um, is the, this PV blood flow, the top one. Um, and maybe we'll, and so we'll, we'll go ahead and launch that notebook. Um, and so what this one is going uh, to look at is um, running ParaView in, in batch mode, right? And so there's a couple of things, and, and we'll look at the, the, the script in a second. Um, so let's assume that we have a, a time series of, of data, and, we're, and we've set up our, our pipeline um, in ParaView. And, and once you do that, I think you know, Dan showed an example of this, of you, know, you set up your pipeline, you have your view all set up, you have a, a bunch of, of um, uh, filters and, and other things you've applied, and now I want to render an animation. Um, in this case, um, we're going to look at a data set. It's got about a, a hundred time steps in it, but you can imagine if you have something that's much more, much larger, much more complicated, um, you may want to save the state, and the way you can do that in pair view is just uh, from the file menu, you can say file, save state, and you can say save it as a, a Python file, a Python script. And then you can then take that Python script and run PV batch um, instead of PV server. So instead of running a server that you're gonna interactively interact with, um, you can run pair view in a batch mode and pass it this Python script, um, and that's what we're gonna do. And so before we actually run that, um, if we go back to um, I'm going to take a quick look at this Python script. So this should already be, it's, um, you'll have a path to it in your notebook. Um, but so this is a script that I, I generated um, from, uh, from Paraview, and I said save Python state, and then I went and I edited it, and I added a couple of things. And basically the things I added were a bunch of lines at the beginning that says, um, Basically, here's a directory where my, um, where my data lives, and, uh, and here's the, the, there's two different data files that I'm gonna load, two different time series. And so I'm basically just gonna create two lists of files, um, and at the top I'm telling it, I'm gonna pass it into this, this script, um, a directory where I wanna put the files, the, the frames that I'm gonna generate, um, and one of the things I want to optimize is that I want to be able to run this in parallel, right? And so if I have, you know, a couple thousand time frames, it'd be nice to be able to run, to generate those in parallel. So what I can do is I can pass this script um, a couple of variables and say, start it at this frame and generate this number of frames, all right? And then I can submit multiple jobs that will then work on different chunks of frames from this, this big long list. Um, and we'll do that uh, using the notebook in a second. Uh, and then the other thing that, that I added, um, well, is, uh, so I stored these, these list of files in these, uh, these couple of lists, um, RBC good and RBC bad. Um, you'll see that um, uh, down here where we have our our readers, so this, these are, are, are things that were already generated by this script. I just replaced the list of files with um, uh, set file name to equal to these lists. And then I added a little chunk of code at the bottom that says, um, okay, 
it's a little bit low on the screen, but it says get all the time, the, the, uh, the list of time values um, from this uh, series of, of time steps. And then I'm just going to loop through starting at start frame and going for however many frames I told it to set the active view to a particular time step and save that image. Um, and it'll just loop over however many frames I told it to do. All right, so this is a script that we're going to pass um, to PV batch. So now if we go back to our, our pair view notebook, um, and so the first thing you want to do is in this, in this first cell, if you replace the script where it says your Cooley login name here to whatever your login name is. And so it's going to set up a couple of paths using your, your home directory um, to say where it's going to put the frame. So that's what this frames directory is. Um, it's going to create a, a video file at the end. So it's um, what we're going to do is we're going to submit a couple of jobs basically to the queue. It's going to um, launch those jobs, render all those frames, and then once the frames are all done being rendered, um, we're going to run a, a FFmpeg uh, a command to encode those, uh, those frames into a movie, and then we'll display them in the notebook. Um, and so if we run this, once we, right, uh, once we set our, our login name, if we run that first cell, um, Oops, um, on the next one. So then I'm just telling it um, overall there's 100 frames in, in our time step. Um, and I said how many, how many is half of it? So I'll submit two jobs, um, uh, one just to render the first half of the frames, one to render the second half. Um, so this next cell we're not going to run just yet. That's the cleanup when we're done. So if we wanted to. Um, get rid of the frames once we're done. Um, right, so if I run this cell here, the, the LS cell, right, it's basically looking at that directory. So okay, there's nothing in it yet. Um, what we're going to end up doing is, is submitting, like I said, we're going to submit two jobs, um, but we need to tell it uh, what our project and what queue to use. All right, so now if we run, before we run this, so we'll take a look at what this is doing, right, is it's only going to take a handful of seconds to run each of these. But so I'm going to do Q sub, um, run two commands for Q sub. I'm going to tell it some information about how to set the display. And then we're going to pass it the, the name of that script that we just looked at a second ago. Um, we're going to tell it the start frame, how many frames, and um, the directory where it should put uh, the frames when it's done. Okay, so if I run this cell, it printed out so those variables that I set, and you'll notice it has a couple of numbers. Those are the, the job IDs of the jobs that I just put in the queue, right? So if I now, if I run this next cell, I'll see that I have two jobs in the queue, and they're currently queued. the previous cell. So one quick comment here and um, in line with uh, what Mike was saying, right? There's a lot of parameters to keep track of here, right? Lots of bookkeeping and that's a reason, that, that's a good reason for using the notebook, right? So, so you do it once and, and then you can repeat it. You don't need to memorize this. You know, quickly what the rest of this notebook is doing is just calling a thing to look at how many frames are there and um, generating the animation. Um, similar to what I think everyone ha had said earlier, Cyrus and Dan, um, and I think John mentioned this too, right, that typically the applications can encode the, the frames for you, but um, at least when I do things like this, I tend to, for the, some of the same reasons they mentioned, right, that you may want to do annotations and other stuff after the fact. And so um, more often than not, I'll just generate the raw frames, save them as PNG files, and then encode them later. Especially like in this case, we're actually submitting multiple jobs to work on different chunks of frames 
that we're then going to put into one movie, right? And so um, in that case, uh, we'll, we'll do these sort of in, in sections or whatever. Um, and then you can en encode it. I'm going to take one class, last look to see if I... Oh, all right. I'm exiting, so that means that must mean that I ran. Uh, so finally, so I, I have my 100 frames. I'm going to go ahead and encode them. That only takes a second. All right, and so here's our little animation. <coughs> right, so hopefully you should end up with this, uh, a little animation like this when you're done. Um, and again, so, you know, sort of the, the gist of this was being able to save our state file out after doing our interactive setup um, and then breaking it up into uh, multiple steps that, uh, or multiple submissions that we can run uh, simultaneously and have our, our frames generated for us um, much more quickly. All right, so let's, let's jump. Um, uh, to the next one we're going to look at is this, uh, yeah, the Sensei Catalyst one. Um, and then if you go into that notebook, uh, so, so Silvio presented on this a little bit earlier this morning, right, talking about um, doing in situ, uh, doing uh, visualization analysis while your simulation is running. And so this is a little toy example of that where, um, Again, we'll look at this. Uh, if you change uh, in this first cell, change the my login to be your login name. Um, uh, and this is going to set up um, a bunch of directories and, and other variables that are going to end up getting used in this uh, notebook. Um, and this is just making sure there's no, right? Yeah, that's just making sure that there's uh, no files hanging around. Um, when we run Catalyst, or excuse me, when we run um, uh, the simulation, we're gonna pass it a, an XML configuration file that, that tells it how to run Sensei. And so if we run this next cell, that's just generating this config file um, and then we'll quickly look at what, what that says, is that when, in, when the application calls, makes its call into to Sensei, it's gonna run this uh, catalyst analysis. It tells it how to, how to set up its pipeline. It's gonna create a slice through the, uh, an array called data. Um, and it's gonna generate images um, with with various um, parameters, right? So these are basically the parameters for um, doing this, uh, this visualization while the application is running. Uh, this next cell uh, is just setting up some parameters, some configurations for actually running the simulations part of it, right? And so if we run the, these various cells, that's what this is about, okay. Um, So this next cell is going to be similar to the one that we ran to submit. Is that right? Oh, no, this is um, generating the script that we're going to pass to QSub. Is that right? Is that the first one? Yeah. Right. So we're going to, this is the script that we're going to submit. So we're going to submit a job on Cooley um, to run this application called Oscillator. And while it's running, it's going to make a call into Sensei using, uh, and by passing it this oscillator.xml file that we just generated, um, it's going to tell it to generate these images uh, while we're, while the simulation is running, right? So again, um, telling it the uh, project in Q to use, hopefully the issue with the old reservation is no longer going to be 
problematic. And so now my job is queued. Nope, that other thing is still there. So chances are my job's not going to run. But so what, so I'll just explain what this is doing while we're waiting for my job to start. Um, similar to, to the other one, this, this next command just looks to see how many files are in our, um, that have been completed, right? And so while this little simulation runs, it makes a call. There's a place in the code that calls into Sensei, um, again, using the, the configuration that we file that we set it that we gave to it. Um, and then it calls the other part of the, the analysis side to, to run um, Catalyst to generate uh, a, a slice through the data that, it's, that it generated. And then it writes the image. So it never actually saves the data itself to disk. It, it generates the data and then passes that data in memory to th the analysis side where the image gets generated um, and then uh, the, the image gets write, written to disk rather than the whole data set. Right, and then the rest of the notebook is similar um, to the previous one where we're gonna generate a movie um, from those time steps. Um, oh, so my job's starting. It says it's running. All right, so now I've got a handful of images that are done already. Um, and so if I, in this next frame, if, or next uh, cell, if I update this frame number to some number of, of one of the files that have already been written, and I run it. So this is a file that's been written, written right? And we'll see that, um, I guess at this point, there's only, this, this one only has 50 steps, so. At this point, the, the simulation's done. Um, but you know, because it's pretty fast, but you can see that while it was still running, it was generating images. This is one of those images. Um, we'll go ahead and um, encode that into a movie. And again, we can load that movie up here, play it back. Right, so in this case, we're, we're leveraging the, the cluster, Cooley, to do the heavy lifting, um, but we're doing all of that from the notebook, right? And, and so this is a way to, to easily access those things and, um, again, sort of that providence, right? I've generated this notebook, so now I can go back and look at how, what did I need, what did I do to generate those things? Um, so I know that was pretty quick, and, but does anyone have any questions on any of this stuff so far? Um, yeah, we have just been using Python, but we've had R enabled. We can, ena we can enable Julia. Um, definitely within, the, actually I should say, within the, the Jupyter Hub, the first one I did work, walk through, we definitely can enable stuff there. Um, and I think since Cooley's an x86 architecture, I think we can enable with Julia backends. It's when we get into some of our more exotic hardware that we might want to launch jobs onto that we won't have appropriate backend. But yeah, I think, I think this is all doable. Right, and the stuff that we've done right now, right, all, all of this stuff is running on that, that Jupyter node in terms of, um, you know, the code that's running in the notebook is running on, on that. And we're, you know, leveraging that node to do the Q sub to submit these things to the queue. The things that we're gonna do next, hopefully quickly, and I, I will go ahead and turn it over to um, to Silvio to explain this next part. Um, yes. But we're gonna we're gonna actually stand up a Jupiter 
uh, notebook that's actually running on a backend node. Um, actually, and and he'll, he'll step, that, step you through that. I'm actually going to switch users because they have. Uh, yeah, yeah, fine. Stuff on my user. Oh, you may not because of the machine rebooted. Oh, that's fine. Uh, so, uh, one of the things uh, we want to show is uh, how to use, uh, how, how to send up your own uh, Jupyter server, right? So, uh, now we've, we've been using a Jupyter hub. That is a specific node, a dedicated node connected to Cooley and running your job. But you could also, if, if you have an Anaconda or something like that, which we have in Cooley, you could grab a node in, in an interactive session and actually uh, launch uh, a Jupyter server. So that's, that's what I'm trying, uh, what, what I'm gonna try to show in the few minutes we have. If we don't get, uh, uh, get that done, uh, we'll be around later. Uh, so those who are interested in, in seeing that, uh, uh, let us know, okay, and we can show you. So uh, coming back to the uh, original, uh, this is not what I need, I need this link, the link of the repo, right? Uh, if you click on, on the link to the repo, uh, you can see a, a markdown, you can find a markdown document here that, that I hope is readable there, right? Uh, with instructions on how to get this done. Uh, so quickly, uh, uh, login to Cooley, uh, from a Cooley login node, you do this essentially, which is uh, generating a config file right, and creating your own password encrypted, and then edit the config file and add this encrypted password uh, in the file, in this specific file. Uh, I've done that, I'm not gonna go over that in the interest of time. And then you do a, a, a couple more things. Uh, essentially, you tell it to listen on local host, only you don't want connections from outside because it's possible to do it, but there may be security issues if you, if you don't use uh, SS, uh, SSL certificates. So we prefer it that you do it in the internal network and you uh, tell it to listen on port 8000, okay? So with that, and let me log into Cooley here. Enter your crypto key. Okay, so from this logging node, what you do is essentially uh, launch an interactive session. So this command will give you a prompt uh, or a bash shell on a backend node, assuming that it goes through the queue, right? So while we wait for this, what I want to show you is uh, similar examples to the ones uh, that uh, Joe showed previously. Uh, in one of them, uh, we try to run, we run actually our visualization uh, application called VL3. Uh, and we feed it uh, data from cosmology simulations, right? So we set up some parameters, uh, we create different views with a little bit of Python code, uh, save those settings, run, generate frames, and code them in a movie and, and show it. I got my node, my node is 063. So now I can, uh, following this, uh, this instructions, just do this. You add that key in case you don't have it in your, in your uh, dot soft dot coolie. And with that, it launches the uh, server. We're running out of time. I'll try to do the next steps very quickly to show you at least 
one of the examples. So the next thing is, is to uh, establish a tunnel from your local machine, from your local SSH, and with multiple hubs. Here I will replace the name of the node I got. These ports are all good. And I will replace my username here. So with this, we will be able to connect our local browser directly to the Jupyter server running on a backend node. Again, you enter your crypto key. didn't like the port, I'll change to another port. You could pick random ports here. Sometimes you may have used them recently and, and, and it will not like it. Uh, so I'll do 9008. Like 9008. There's something funky in this SSH client, actually. Okay, if it stays there without complaining, it means that the tunnel is established. So, if that works, I should be able to point my browser to localhost 9008, the port that I used, and now it's asking for my password. So I'm connected to the uh, Jupyter server that I launched. So this is the password that I created in the step before. I don't want to remember it. I'll point it to the repo. And this, this is the VL3 example, the, the directory called VL3 Cosmo. Click on it, open the notebook, and I'll go quickly over it. So it's similar to the one uh, Joe showed before. Uh, I'll reset. I'll restart and clear output. Okay, so and quickly run over it. So remember to change your, your username there. We will generate uh, 50 different uh, snapshots. And this piece of Python code here will generate those 50 different views. It, it will set the camera in, in 50 different positions, actually creating a circle around the, the, uh, the node, the, the, uh, the volume that we're going to visualize. Uh, keep it going here. And this is the point where we launch VL3, right? With different uh, parameters. So this is the resolution uh, we're uh, setting at, passing it the, the file that we generated before with the camera positions. Here we tell it where to save uh, the frames and things like that. And, and you, can, you can change those parameters. So once it's running, it's running locally now, right? It's, we don't need to submit it to the queue. It's running on the node, the same node where we're running the notebook. And that's one of the advantages, right? And you see the start, and while the start is there, it means that it's running. It takes uh, less than a minute, under a minute, to complete. So it's completed now, and there's some output there. So let's see if it generated actually frames, and you can see that it generated 50 
uh, snapshots in PNG format. Again, now we will call FFmpeg to uh, create a movie with those snapshots. And now we will embed the movie here in the notebook. And it looks something like that. So this is uh, actually a volume rendering of a small, really, really small data set uh, coming from the uh, hack team running at Argon. So that's an example, uh, we're out of time. We have one more uh, notebook that we can uh, show you later on. Okay, any questions?